Well, uh, welcome uh, to an introduction to uh, what would seem to be a very controversial uh, assertion um, or claim uh, that sex equals God's existence um, or that uh, the physical act of sex points to the transcendent and imminent God found in the Christian scriptures. Um, it has been a month or so, maybe longer, since I debated this. Uh, this was just strictly an audio debate um, between myself and uh, uh, a uh, Burbs from Canada uh, who graciously agreed to debate this topic uh, with me. And um, the actual uh, wording of the um, debate, I'll just pull it up here, um, was the resolved uh, that the uh, sex um, uh, points to the transcendent and imminent God of the uh, Christian Bible. Um, and this was, um, I took the affirmative position on this and Burbs from Canada uh, took the uh, negative and so um, basically what we have on the uh, this is uh, the audio podcast debate is found on the debate God dot org debate God is one word uh, no um, no intervening spaces or, or characters and um, uh, I think it's on the main uh, home page it's a, I think it might be reworded to be something like is the physical act of sex um, evidence for the existence of God um, so at any rate, I will. Uh, I'm just officially recording a a uh, video to um, represent the argument um, that was given there um, uh, with uh, um, again with this uh, the debate partner in in Canada. Um, I would like to argue um, that uh, to be precise, that human sexual activity is evidence for the uh, transcendent, imminent God as best described or characterized in the Christian Bible. And um, I'm going to look at this issue from two different perspectives. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time demonstrating that it's only um, the Christian God. It's just um, it seems like it best fits his his character and his nature in terms of the transcendence being above um, his created works and also dwelling within uh, or imminent his imminence um, dwelling within creation and of course uh, chiefly um, most pointedly in, in bringing his son Jesus Christ here to earth um, to to suffer and die uh, for our sins and to be raised again on the third day after his death um, I'd like to, so I'm going to look at this from two different um, angles one of them is I'm going to look at the, how the Christian worldview uh, and non theistic naturalistic worldviews would uh, say about uh, sex, its origins, purposes, and its nature. Um, when we hold them up and, and compare them, I will argue that the Christian worldview is a greater coherence in explaining mystery, wonder, and the beauty of sex and how sex um, can become degrade, degraded and can degrade its participants. Um, so my position will be that sex uh, fits more naturally uh, into a Christian worldview than it does into a non uh, Christian worldview. After this discussion, um, I will actually um, look at the act of sex itself in terms of the um, the properties that it has um, in containing the uh, transcendent and imminence, um, and obviously in terms of, of feelings, the feelings of the participants um, in the the sex act. Um, and I will also refer to an eminent psychiatrist uh, who is also a Christian, M. Scott Peck. Um, who wrote um, about this and about how giving up the self, um, giving up the self or ego in the act of sex um, does actually point to God's character and his opinion. Um, contrary to what some people per uh, uh, would regard um, the Bible as probably a a group um, or list of rules about sexual behavior and um, sex is a response to God and his plan to populate the earth uh, we see this in the very first book of the Bible Genesis in Genesis 1 chapter uh, excuse me Genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28 we read so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and multiply excuse me, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's the NIV 
uh, translation. So here we have the first biblical reference to sex, an implicit reference in the very first chapter of the Bible. Um, God's given us the gift of sex in reference to filling the earth. The gift of sex is important to God since he mentions it really as um, one of the first tasks or the first task of humans. And uh, in the next chapter we read that Adam declared this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. The commentary on this is follows. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Uh, later, Adam and Eve, of course, uh, disobey God, being tempted by Satan in the form of the serpent, and they plunge the world into sin and darkness. Uh, however, there is a promise made of a coming Savior who will crush the head of Satan. So I think that we can detect a pattern emerging here. Sex is implicit in God's first instructions to the created uh, pet couple to reproduce. Two, sex represents a union of two different parties. That is, the two will become one flesh in that reference. And three, after the fall, there's great potential for abuse wherein sex could become degrading if mishandled. This view has coherence and it best represents our natural intuitions about sex. That's mainly good, but it does have the potential to be uh, misused or abused. On the other hand, in evolutionary terms, we have a somewhat confusing uh, picture. We're not taught that we are God's special creation, of course. We're taught we came from hominid ancestors. Sometimes evolutionists look at chimpanzees and bonobos and tries, try to decipher how sex came to be uh, developed, um, the origin, we might say, of sex in Homo sapiens. Um, wild claims are often made. For example, in the most current analysis of early human sexuality, um, or one of the most current, uh, is called Sex at Dawn, The Prehistoric Origins of Modern Sexuality by Christopher Ryan, Ph.D., and Shakilda Jetha, M.D. And the authors admit the subjective nature of interpreting somewhat scant evidence for sexual norms and mores in primitive society. Nonetheless, they managed to assert that, quote, a few million years ago, our ancestors, Homo erectus, shifted from gorilla, a gorilla-like mating system where an alpha male fought to win and maintain a harem of females to one in which most males had sexual access to females. Ironically, they then state that few of any experts dispute this interpretation, but then cite primarily C.O. and Lovejoy's work as an opponent. Uh, of this view. Um, now, C.O. and Lovejoy is noted for um, his view that um, the uh, in very primitive societies um, uh, where our ancestors would have dwelt, that they would have been um, pairing together. So they would have been what we'd call monogamous, um, one man for one uh, woman. And um, uh, that uh, apparently is uh, is disputed um, we just we have some obviously some different viewpoints of this uh, subject matter that are being presented uh, we don't have one consistent theme uh, as we would have you know, in the scriptures um, there, I have a quotation uh, from Lovejoy uh, that I used in the debate. I don't think I'll quote the entire thing. It's from Science, uh, October 2nd, 2009. It has to do a little bit with the, uh, his view, again, of the, um, of the uh, pairing um, that, that he, he infers would have occurred um, in the early, uh, some of the early um, primitive um, groupings of, of, of hominids. Um, we will all move on here to um, go back to Ryan and Jetha. Um, they favor an interpretation given by Timothy Taylor, 1996, who writes, A major event in the development of sexual inequality occurred, I argue, when farming was invented, a system by which people could produce food when they wanted it rather than relying, like every other mammalian species, on natural availability. Taylor heavily leans on selectual sexual selectiveness or sexual selection, even when it would seem that natural selection would dictate against it. Um, he winds up admitting um, a sort of, quote, Lamarckian uh, evolution um, at page 9 uh, of his book. And um, Lamarckianism is uh, rejected, of course, at least in Orthodox um, Darwinism. Uh, at, at best, it would seem to be highly speculative in terms of a way of um, looking back and trying to understand how uh, these hominid uh, groupings of uh, individuals would have um, um, developed their their uh, norms for sexual activity. Um, it's uh, it's definitely not a consistent picture, uh, which we do have in the Bible regarding man, man and Eve being uh, Adam and Eve being special creations of God. 